Hello everybody, welcome to Frame by Frame. This is episode four. Sitting next to me is... Andy. <laughs> you were thinking I was going to do it. I thought you were going to say okay. my name. Sitting next to me is... Andy. And sitting next to me is... Stephen. See, that was a bit better. <laughs> yeah, it's like the worst double act ever. <laughs> the worst double act ever. Not exactly the two Ronnies, are we? <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, today is in, in America they wouldn't know who the two Ronnies are, so that would be fuck them. Um, oh, then they can use <laughs> look it up Google, Google on YouTube. Ronnies. Two Ronnies, very fantastic stuff, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like yeah, Anton Deck. She was starting on a com- yeah, but good <laughs> and smaller foreheads. So. You talking to me? Did you have a brain tumor for breakfast? Well, who the hell else are you talking? You talking to me? I'm funny how. I'm Peter Vinkman. We all go a little mad sometimes. Man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. Yeah. I'm kind of a big deal. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Actually, it's going to be a little bittersweet, because we're going to be talking about terrible films today. Because last week you said, I I think we're going to need to um, review something we hate. Yeah. Because so far you've just enjoyed everything that you've... you've Well, yeah, yeah. we've basically talked about things that we we really enjoy, and then it's... Just to balance the equilibrium, I thought we'll talk about Birdemic. Oh, Birdemic and... The Room. Uh, could there be a worse double bill for a viewing? I do I do have a confession, though. Um, uh, the other day I watched Guardians of the Galaxy. You did? Yes. Oh. I thought I'd surprise you. Fantastic. Well, yeah, let's talk about that then. Forget about that. <laughs> Birdemic in the room. Let's talk about Guardians. Can we? Yes, we can, we can do anything we want. Let's oh, do it. Well, well, did you like it? Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you just yet. I think we should just have the trailer run through right now. Okay. Here's the trailer to Guardians of the Galaxy. a threat that could destroy us all. If we're going to save the galaxy, we're going to have to do it together. Partners. Why would you want to save the galaxy? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it! Oh, what the hell? I don't got that long a lifespan anyway. your life for this because right now life's giving us a chance to do what something good something bad a bit of both we will fight beside you i will destroy you and your world first you gotta go through us we're the frickin' guardians of the galaxy. I'm with them. I have a plan. You've got a plan. I have part of a plan. What percentage of a plan? I don't know. 12%. 12%? <laughs> That's a fake laugh. <laughs> it's real. Totally fake. That is the most real authentic, hysterical laugh of my entire life because that is not a plan. I am Groot. So what? It's better than 11%. What the hell does that have to do with anything? Thank you. Groot's the only one of you who has a clue. (laughs) (laughs) Come to 
cinemas in 3D. So did you enjoy it? You know well, what I think of it? I've got to say that I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Oh, fantastic. I, I was... Um, at start, I was very suspicious. Very kind of like, oh, right, yeah, here we go. Yeah, Because you don't know the characters, and you kind of have that separation to begin with. You're like, oh, okay, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but... Yeah. But then all, all of a sudden, they started to come up with these amazing lines. I kind of forgot that, you know, that uh, that um, suspicious, critical side of you that when yeah. watching science fiction, you just start pulling everything apart? Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's the beauty of this film. It's so well written. It you don't... makes you let go. Yeah. You just become invested yes. in the story, the characters, everything about it. And you realise that finally... This is actually science fiction uh, as entertainment for the sake of entertainment. It is there to entertain yeah. and take you on a ride. And it was a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. But don't you think that's a very brave way to start the film? With dying... Dying mum. Dying mum. But it, it set up a perfect thread arc, what, thread through. Yeah. With the music and that. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. And it introduced him as the character who was never going to let go because he has the music. Mm. So that's deep. Yeah. And yeah. yet it's still fun, and accessible. Oh yeah, but I thought because I'd like to have been in a room with the you know all the heads of Marvel mm -hmm. when James Gunn gives them the script because it was it was written by someone else. I forget the name now, but he completely. You know, he rewrote it. He took aspects of the original script and rewrote it. Yes. But then reading that and said, where I've got this massive space opera, but it starts with his mum dying in hospital. And it's, it's really tough. Of cancer. Of cancer, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And when yeah. she, she reaches out, you know, Peter, take my hand, and he's too scared to, and he's sort of like... Yeah, you know, yeah. And that's a really, really dark, ups, you know, touching, upsetting moment. Mm. mm. And that's the kind of odd thing because it starts off so, so set in reality, that the moment that he's suddenly taken away in in, well, yeah. in a magical world that is because it stays dark up until he switches his Walkman on because you've got that scene, and then the actual abduction of him when he runs out into that in into the field, and also the, the way the spaceship that sort of like turns on him, it's quite. It's kind shadow. of like, yeah, it's shadow yeah. and it's quite eerie and it obviously gets abducted and next thing you know, it's 20 years later and he's on Morag, I think is the planet. Who's she? Oh, you mean the planet. Yeah. Okay. And even walking through there and, you know, that's quite dark and, you eerie, know, it's yeah. just like... A, it, sinister. Yeah, sinister. Yeah. And then next thing you know, he puts the music on and, and then he just sudden, starts yeah. dancing. And that's oh. it. And then, because... Up until then, I was thinking, this is not the film I thought this was going to be, because I got excited by the trailer. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. And then the moment it, the music kicks in, he starts dancing, I was like, ah, here we are. It's, it's like a switch. Yeah. It just switches on. It's like lighting up a room after going through all these dark corridors to a surprise party. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, surprise! <laughs> it's like, it is what you thought it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that element of doubt before you go to a surprise party and you think, oh, they've all forgotten, haven't they? It's all dark, corridors and... Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. surprise! Yeah, they forgot my <laughs> birthday, the bastard. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> At first, I was a little bit reluctant to kind of embrace the world mm. because I thought, oh, it's, it's gone a little bit too far, too early. I kind of thought... Because usually a character is introduced bit by bit and then... But it was like, boom, he's there. Yeah, but don't, you, no, no explanation. He's not like a new character in a new world. He's literally twenty years later, hmm. and he is where he is. But they, I suppose they have to do that because he has so many char main characters to introduce very quickly, exactly, and then move the story along. Yeah, otherwise it, it starts looking like a George Lucas prequel. Yeah, and no, nobody needed that. No, 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 no. <laughs> but again, I think the way everything's introduced is. It's, it's very well done. It's very clever. Mm. Everybody know. hates each other in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. That's always good. Well, it, they're always trying to get one over on each other all the time. Yeah. You know, when the, the reason Rocket and Groot find Quill is because he's Rocket, got a bounty on his head. Rocket is the raccoon. Raccoon, raccoon. that's right. And Groot is the plant. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Essentially, Quill is um, he's a what's called a ravager. 
and um, Yondu is basically his kind of his boss. He's been, so I reckon he's been sort of a father figure to him. He's the one who abducted him from her Earth. Yeah. And, you know, he's been stealing with them. It's like the bad uncle. He yeah, just yeah. Teaches absolutely. him the way, but then he's rejected. Yeah, so um, he, Quill is sort of. It, they've gone after this orb, which is the reason why he goes to Morag in the first place. Which turns out inside the orb is an infinity stone, which is going Yay. to go into the big Marvel universe. But, um, yeah, so the reason Rocket finds Quill is because he's put a 40,000 units price on his head. Mm-hmm. So they think, well, we'll get Quill. It's great. It's, just, it's great. Great. Yeah. I love it. It's smooth. It's it is. Smooth. It's smooth. And, um, and then they all go into jail. Because at that point, yeah. you've got Gamora, who's after the Quill, who's been sent by Ronan the Accuser. Ronan the Accuser. Yeah. He's very unhappy because of a peace treaty that was signed with the Kree and the Xandarians for, like, I think thousands of years. They've been warring and killing each other, and now they've signed a a peace treaty. And he's not happy about it. He's basically a fundamentalist Kree, I guess you'd call it. So he sends the green girl to kind of be a... Well, to to retrieve the orb. Retrieve the orb, but by... Because if he Mm -hmm. gets the orb... And gives it to. Why am I not remembering these names when I know them all? It's crazy. Shall, shall, I, shall I open the vacuum cleaner? Sa- Thanos. Thanos. He, yes, he has to give. If he gives the orb to Thanos, Thanos will destroy Xandaria. Yes. So there's our story. That's it. It's yeah. all there. Yeah. I don't remember anybody's names in any film. I mean, no disrespect to Guardians of the Galaxy. I do it with every film, unless I've seen it about five times. Then I'm not going to know people's names. Right. I mean, you know, when I watch Shop Girl, it's still Steve Martin, and Claire Danes in those characters. I don't know why I use that film. Yeah. Or Iron Man. I don't think. I, I, yeah, Tony Stark is an easy one. You know. Yeah. He's Tony Stark, but the girl he was with, it's Gwyneth Paltrow. It's Gwyneth. Pepper Potts. What's her name? Pepper Potts. Her name is Pepper Potts. Yeah, that's in it. That's the character's name. That's just a stupid name. <laughs> Blame Stanley. <laughs> Oh, Stan. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. And, and what was I saying? <laughs> no, you can't remember people's names. The purple guy, the big the, the killer. Ronan. No, 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 no. Oh, Drax. Is it Drax? Yeah, yeah, you mean the, the wrestler, Dave Batista. The wrestler, there we go, yeah, yeah. He is a fantastic character. So surprising. Well, when I saw that scene where he's got her against with a knife and yeah. he starts taking the mickey out of him, trying to kind of change the situation you never expect them to be but I love that thing so you know you keep her alive when Ronan comes and then he you know he does that he puts his finger over his neck you know to obviously symbolise you kill him but Jax is like why would I put my finger over his throat (laughs) you know what I mean he's like no no, it's it's a symbol yeah you you get this and they play on it then they all of a sudden they're having a conversation about uh, the, the symbol of throat cutting and and it's it is hilarious yeah this is this is a symbol for you cutting his throat I would not cut his throat I would chop his head clean off it's like well you get and I love the other guy no one ever talks about him but you know the, the the other I don't know what his name is but he's sort of like you get this right don't you and he's like yeah 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 and then Drax looks at him oh no 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 no, no. you know he's a great little character <laughs> and I love that line when he's like um, I'm, I like your knife from keeping it and he's like mm, that was my favourite knife <laughs> Love it. Just little things, yeah. The dialogue in this is is filled with real moments between characters. There. Yeah. Um, it, it, normally in sci-fi films, they just kind of talk about the business. You know, trade federations. Um, <laughs> they just kind of talk about each other and falling in love and those kind of feelings and, and all those wonderful memories we had years ago when we did this. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But no, this one, it really keeps things... Um, you know, it, it keeps all the bits of dialogue that that normally gets snipped out. The small talk, mm. the, um, the 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 segues, uh, the little distractions—they're all in there. 
And my yeah. favourite of those is that, you know, about taking things literally, is when they start talking about Footloose and Kevin Bacon. Yeah. I love that piece, that exchange between the two, when she when he says about, you know, he's, he li- Kevin Bacon lives in a town full of people who have sticks up their ass. Yeah. And she goes, why would they have sticks up their ass? Yeah, well, that's, that's really, really cruel. That's really cruel, yeah. Really cruel. Interesting with that scene. So well. While they were filming it, James Gunn could not get it right. He hated it. He could, on that day of shooting it, he re- rewrote the whole thing, and I think that's where all the Kevin Bacon stuff came from. I think it's great. I mean, must have you know, the Footloose must have been an influence somewhere in there. You know, there must have been. I know he's he's good friends with Kevin Bacon. Oh, that um, helps. Kevin Bacon was the bad guy in his last film, which is called Super. Right. So I know yeah. they they have a friendship. Maybe that's where it's come from. Yeah, I think I think that that would help. And mm. having that, but having the reference in there is perfect. Especially when she reliterates it later on, she says, "Just like Kevin Bacon." Yeah, and when, I'm when like, they just kill all of What I love about that scene, yeah, where they're smashing through that and killing loads of people, and you've got Drax laughing his head off behind them. Yeah, because he just loves the thrill of it. The all. thrill of destroying, you know, it, it happens <laughs> when he's beating people up. He's just laughing his head yeah. off. He loves it, and then she's like, "Yeah, we're just like Kevin Bacon." Yeah, and I love that. It's like, but. We've never seen this kind of exchange before. I mean, I, I, they, they, we've, we've had kind of these oddball collaborations in, in comic books. DC yeah. and Marvel both do it. Um, you know, they, we've had the, the F- Fantastic Four. Mm. Personalities of, you know, to be honest. The odd, yeah. yeah. No, they, they, none of them have... The workable superhero films, I guess, but there's just nothing... Just doing their thing. They're just doing what the, the plot tells them to do and that's it. But mm. these ones, they're kind of they're kind of jumping out of the story and having their own little character moments, which mm. is... You know, which makes you connect with them so much more. Yeah. The Avengers. I mean, again, they're not... Oh, no, 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 no. The no. old agenda. The, the old Avengers, I'm talking... Agendas. <laughs> agendas. Have you got superhero? The agendas. <laughs> yes. I'm a boy. Let, I'm a let, girl. Let me and write that down. <laughs> oh, no, you went for genders. Yeah, that's what I, I went for. Agendas. All oh, right, I agendas. Let, let me plan that. <laughs> let me put that in my file effects. <laughs> That'd be great. It's a big, huge superhero. We just... Just, just plan just stuff. Plan stuff and then the, the film ends. Let's go put this on the whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just bought a new whiteboard. It's magnetic. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> can't wait to do an agenda. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, wow. Final facts, man. He's out of date. He's well jealous. Yeah. yeah. But I know one of my favourite scenes in this scene. <laughs> yeah. One of my favourite scenes in this scene is, you know, um, before they actually go for the big battle and they're all stood in a circle. Well, yes. sat in a circle at first. And talking about trying to come up with a plan. Yes. You know, he's yeah. like, you know, I've got 12% of a plan. <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. When he first wrote the treatment of the script and give it uh, give it to Kevin Feige, Joss Whedon, and other producers were there. Joss Whedon read it, loved it, and he said, there's not enough James Gunn in here. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, it's just, just it's not enough. We want more James. signature. We want more James Gunn. And that's where that scene came from. Yeah. He went home and immediately, in fact, he never, he actually nearly didn't make the film. When um, he went to, you know, talk to him about it. He spoke when he thinking, no one's ever heard of Guardians of the Galaxy. Why would I want to do this? And he was driving home and it just clicked in his head. Oh, actually, you know, he had a few ideas and he thought, I have to make this film. Yeah. And yeah. Thank God he did. Because I don't think any other get, director would have, Done what he's done. No it's, way. It's, he's done it so well, and I'm actually taken aback because when I, like I said, when I was, I was reluctant to watch it because I just thought it was going to be the same old, same old. Mm. I thought it was going to flow just like any other, um, you know, comic book adventure, um, and I was just surprised. And I think it was the dialogue, it was the exchange, it was the pacing, the music, um, the ele- all these elements that. You know, it made it okay, and it harked back to Fifth Element when Luc Besson tried to do something different with science fiction by subverting it and making it a little bit more um, caricature, mm-hmm. but still with some uh, um, amusing moments in it with Mila Jovovich. Jovovich, but um, that it still never got out of that that place of just being characters. Going through the motions and following a plot. Yeah, there was there's still no things jumping out other than multi or multi bass. Right. You know, little little things, but they're only very little. This one kind of has so much going through, and I can understand why you went to see it in the cinema three times. Yeah, because there was so much going on. Well, now I've got, I've got so the Blu-ray much. on Monday. Yeah, 
Um, which is probably a good reason we're not doing Birdemic and had to do Guardians this week because it's still fresh. It's just come out, you know. Hmm. And you still see you see stuff not even now on what sixth time seeing it. Yeah, yeah. When um, they're on the Milano, I think it's um, Quill Ship is called, and uh, they're just just they're on the way to the collectors and they're just talking and groups just in the background doing. He's just like playing with things on the wall like a child would, and I never noticed that before. Yeah, and I was like, it's just the Layers. level of detail and the animation is incredible. You never once questioned that it's a CGI raccoon. It it's just because, yeah. uh, and I think um, obviously the character is fantastic, and you know it's worked very well acted. Mm. I know um, James Gunn's brother actually played the raccoon on um, set as a point of reference for the actors. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, but. He did the Andy Andy Circus bit. Yeah, well, no, it's not motion captured. No, no, no. It was just he was just, he there, was just there as a point the, of reference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing that was motion captured is Thanos. He was motion captured. Got yeah, yeah. And then you've got um, then we're talking about the actors, and there's there's certain controversial moments uh, in the in other reviews that I've noticed that a lot of people are digging at Vin Diesel. Just because you know he's a big name, he's a massive personality, and they're all saying that he, you know, he probably got paid millions just to say three words, four words, five words, five words, <laughs> yeah, because he says the word four as well, doesn't he? And it's like you know why, why, why did he get paid? You know, and, I, and to be honest, if Vin Diesel is approached, Vin Diesel is asked, "Can you voice this character?" You, you know, you only have five words to say, yeah. and if Vin Diesel says yes. That's their deal. That's their deal. That's what they wanted. They went to him and they did it. No matter, it doesn't matter how much he got. He got paid. It's what happened. I've never Get thought. Over it. Yeah, I've it's, never thought yeah. much of Vin Diesel as any kind of actor, but he's brilliant <laughs> as Groot. But he's fantastic. I, I can't. Did he, did he actually? Was he actually on the set as Groot? No, 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 no. He just came in and did the voice acting. Just the voice acting, but. But what when people was, say that it's it, people are saying that it is overrated that anybody could have done it. No, I don't think I, I disagree because um, they had James Gunn tried doing it, his brother tried doing it. They had the actor who was playing Groot on as a point of reference. They yeah. had him try and do it. No one did it. It was when Vin Diesel came in and tried out for it. He, they, he just yeah. that was it. There was something about the way he did it every time. Yeah. Every, it, every single I am Groot is different. It is, but when he's saying I am Groot. James Gunn wrote what he's actually saying. So when Vin Diesel's... I know, it's bloody lead. Yeah, the yeah. leads are scraping, but it's okay. So when you know Vin Diesel's saying, I am Groot, he actually knows what he should be saying, if you know what I mean. Yes. What he's yeah. doing. Which is helpful as a reference. But then, yeah, it, I think that's the problem with, with all these people is that they're fixated on, on an element that uh, of him being paid to say five words and that what's is what they're basing it yeah, what's it and got to do with them, to do with them? it's it, exactly I, th- I think you know Vin Diesel was, was asked he has absolute right to say yes and no you know James Gunn has absolutely right to ask anybody he wants to do it yeah. I'm glad he didn't ask Morgan Freeman <laughs> because Groot would have a lot more to say <laughs> Groot will be saying yes but the infinity stone is actually made of this and that and we we must be careful not to do uh, this and that well now you've mentioned Margaret Freeman exposition in the film oh, well, well yeah the exposition is, is still there it's still there but what I like about it the biggest part of exposition for me and when I first watched it I was kind of like oh here we go in the treating is like we're stupid when the collector's explaining about the infinity stone yeah and um, the big celestial beings that could, you know, and how it can destroy planets and stuff. You see the flash, and all, yeah, yeah, and you're thinking, right, all right, we're getting backstory, and I didn't really need Lord of this. the Rings kind of feeling yeah. about it. You but know? then you've got Rocket, who's mm-hmm. sort of like bored, senseless. He's got his hands in his hands. He's like, all right, Whitey, I don't care, just pay me my money. And I'm like, great, brilliant. You've given us the exposition. But you've also told us that you that one of the characters doesn't need the exposition. He just wants the friggin' money. Yeah. That's a great way of you know of giving what producers hmm. and studios want, but also taking away at the same time. And, and to be honest, exposition is always needed, and it's not always easy to disguise it. Hmm. Um, Terminator is an example of that, where they they had the car chase, 
with Kyle Reese and Sarah um, Sarah Connor, mm. and the exposition of him explaining um, what happens in her future, and everything, the reason why he's there, and the, the time travel thing, and the, the rise of machines, it's all done during a car chase. Yeah, it's done as as because he's desperately trying to tell her to convince her. There's a purpose behind the exposition. Yeah, yeah. It's there to convince her, but it's also there to inform us. What a lot of films tend to do with exposition is they are, they tend to bring in the audience point of view character. The audience point of view character is that 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 fish out of water who is put in a place and has to have everything explained to them. Mm. It's the Will Smith of Men in Black. Yeah. I said, I haven't been in this world before. Could you explain it to me? Yeah. Because I'm standing here with the audience behind me and they want to know as well. But with with this, you know, you don't get that chance because you've got 20, 20 year ellipse between him being abducted and him being in there. Mm. Well, Nothing well, is explained as to what that universe is and where it is. Well, it doesn't I, need to be explained. I think that the reason I was a bit funny with that is that I suppose that exposition needs to be there because of the build in a, a bigger universe of films that are yet to come yeah so we I guess we need to know what the Infinity Stones are for and what they're used for what they're capable of and why Thanos is trying to get hold of them yeah so I, I just felt a bit oh you know I did up until Rocket just complaining it just, I don't care about all this I just want to get yeah. paid yeah. Would it would it have worked if it was simply a, a a glowing crystal inside a box? Would would people have have feared it or felt as though it was important if it was just like a pulp fiction MacGuffin? If they just opened it and their faces glowed up and they, there was no exposition about what the crystal did, what the, what the the orb did, you know? Would it? it have, I, th- I think it would have worked, but it wouldn't have set up the it, universe that they happened to set up for, so, for, for future films so therefore it was completely necessary yeah yeah like I say I was just when I, that was the only yeah. that's the only thing I could take I'm yeah. trying to be really picky really, you know yeah I mean? it's good it's good because we know we, we I think we were always afraid of exposition being something that that oh gosh but you know films have to have it stories have to have it yeah it just doesn't always have to be Morgan Freeman <laughs> no it doesn't have to be delivered in that way <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's good because it does. It, it didn't feel as though it was exposition for exposition's sake, and that's what it is. They weren't wearing a t-shirt saying, "Here's the exposition bit." Yeah. Are you ready, kids? I tell you, there's an interesting thing with the making of this film that all the music was composed before they filmed it. The score. The score. Yeah, you know, the, when obviously all this, the soundtrack is incredibly important. You yeah, know, the songs and that. But the score is just emotionally there as a, exactly. I thought it was interesting because usually, obviously, they'll make a film, to. edit it all together, and then send it to some composer yeah. and do something brilliant with it. But what you wanted is obviously the the guy who composed it would have read the script and has you know has made understand the, the, the nuances yeah, of the scenes. Yeah. So like the part where Quill essentially sacrifices himself for Gamora, you know, he goes out to space and puts the mask on her. Yeah, in the hope yeah. that you know he gets picked up by. It's pretty intense, though. Yeah, well, the music in the background was playing while they were doing that scene mm. to sort of use the music to enhance their performance, which I think is a really good way of making a film. It's doing it in the opposite way around. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really clever idea because it, you could say that um, the acting informs the music. Mm. which is true but then music can also inform the acting because yeah. a lot of the times when they are doing these scenes they have an alternate soundtrack alternative soundtrack they probably have a Crimson Tide or something completely from a different you yeah. know. they use other music to kind of bring out the emotion on set yeah well I know Cameron Crowe he always has a copy of Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys anytime he's making a film because um, he, he'll put a certain track and go this is how you're feeling this is what you're going through yeah. you know yeah. what I mean and that's common. That's common practice yeah. in a lot of films to have alternate. Yeah, but to actually have the actual score already written and ready. Yeah, yeah. So they can. Yeah, great. Only if it's ever a, a remake or something that is already established will that actually happen in the universe that it mm. exists. Like Star Trek, for example, they yeah. they will always have the same kind of music. Um, so that's yeah. And then of course, yeah, yeah. Where, where was I going with? with John Williams and E.T. I mean they couldn't they did that I mean it, you've, you've seen that scene at the very end where E.T. is taken up yeah. and they, they, they showed you what it would be like without music and how it's just a lot of people just standing around looking at 
looking yeah. sad. Yeah. John Williams' music really makes it get you. And that's the same with that. So having that on the set, it takes it hold to a whole new level. Yeah. I sort of, I wasn't that impressed with the theme. You know, the music. It's not, it's not that memorable. No. The I, music I, when is. When I hear it, it sounds like the theme to the Avengers Assemble film to me. Mm-hmm. They all sound alike to me. I yeah, don't... I'm not sure if it's the same composer. It might be. I'll yeah. check that. But um, so that the actual music, the actual theme to Guardians, I wasn't overly mm. fond of. It's yeah. just workable. You know, it's fine. It's all right for that. But you know, it's on the score and it's there to, there to to serve the story, not to kind of make it make it as memorable. Which is a shame because I like to be able to listen to music and feel as though I, I know it because of the film mm. but at the same time it doesn't bother me if, if if the film has done what it needs to do the music doesn't have to be yeah, independent to I it I suppose maybe you don't want to get off my glasses pussy that's right <laughs> yeah so yeah it doesn't but, have to but because the actual soundtrack the actual cassette that Quill's got is more important that makes those sense. songs because that's his call back to his mum that's his call back to going home it's a character in itself that it music. is yeah. and that was you know that went to number one in iTunes the actual tracks you know it's funny how that is how a mixtape of, of already existing music that's already out there can actually suddenly be purchasable, because, purchasable again because it's a song, an ensemble yeah I, I can't fault anything else in the movie because it is true to the to the um, to the world and the environment that it's mm. trying to portray a lot of people are quite sniffy about Ronan the accuser of being just a generic a generic bad guy I think he's fine I think it works perfectly well I don't really it's funny they say that because I actually do not I didn't even care about the conflict between him and them um, you know it was supposed to be something that you care about but to me I, I was just more concerned about how they were going to get along well, that's, the film so, is about them coming together. Yeah. And, you know, becoming a, a family. If so you will. It, I didn't even, I don't even, I don't even remember what he looks like, the bad guy. I know Michael Rooker, he's the, you know. Michael I, Rooker's I, brilliant in it. He's I, so good. Have you ever seen Michael Rooker in anything when he's not been brilliant? Um, he just seems to be an actor who can just bring it every time. Yeah. Even, even if he's in something that's not brilliant, he's just great in it. Even Cliffhanger. You remember mm. that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was quite surprised um, about. The opening scene of that 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 film, and um, it, it, you you've seen it, right? Cliffhanger, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, the, the first scene is is probably the most profound. Uh, it's one of those scenes that stays with you, like the bagging in the face of Pan's Labyrinth. These moments that you yeah, have yeah. that stay with you, or, or, you know, Fredo hugging Michael Corleone in The Godfather Two. Um, funny enough, Cliffhanger is it, the, the opening scene stays the, the, with me. Yeah, like. Um... The part in Spice World, the movie, when Roger Moore talks about drums. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Was he in that movie? He? Yeah, because he used to say these little strange... I can't even believe I've seen this film, but... Is that your link to... No, to... no, 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 not at all. I don't know why I just thought of it, but he, you know, he just said these weird things like, the drummer with no legs has no backbeat. And then he'd hang up on them and I'm like, what? I just like Roger Moore. That's anyway. actually, yeah, well, that's, that's actually quite good. That's, yeah, probably, that's yeah. probably the, the only... It gets wasted because it's uh, it's in a Spice World movie, but yeah. uh, Spice Girls. But yeah, back to Cliffhanger. Yes, quickly. Spice Girls, really? Spice Girls? He goes to Spice Girls with this. I mean, why? I mean, why do I put it with this? Why? Okay, Cliffhanger. <laughs> you know, Woody <laughs> Allen then. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, like, why would you go back to this? Why would you go back it's to these things? You have to keep on bringing it up, you know. It's great, right, fine. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the the scene is that uh, they're they're trying to cross a, a ravine and they're on a uh, you know, on a rope or something. Uh, and they're yeah, trying yeah. to get onto the helicopter because they're in trouble, and uh, and and she literally is just hanging on. Yeah, he's holding her hand. hand. He's holding her hand, hand, and the glove is slipping off, and yeah. and the, the look of fear in her face is incredible. The it, it scared the hell out of me that because it's just the whole idea of someone just being dropped, mm. and then knowing that they they're just gonna that such a long way down before they actually hit anything, and that that is there's no way out. There's no yeah. there's no. You know, but Michael Rooker in that scene, at the very end when she drops, he looks over at Sylvester Stallone with those dagger eyes. Yeah. That, that look of 
yeah, everything, every every single thing that you can think of is going through his mind, and that that is that is good acting. I mean, he's, he's, that's yeah. just Michael Rocco. Yeah, doing. I just I do believe he's an actor who just brings it every time. You know what I mean? Interesting. Do you remember Ace Ventura parodying that? I think it's Ace Ventura really? when Nature Calls. It's the second one, and it's brilliant. But funnily enough, I'm, I I can't be was Michael sure Rocco in that? No, no, no. Oh, okay, I can't be sure of it, but he parodies it by he's holding a raccoon. I'm sure it's a raccoon. A raccoon. It's the same thing, and he he ends. He can't hold it. He can't hold onto the raccoon's hand, and the raccoon just falls into the ravine, and obviously dies. And Ace Ventura ends up going to a monastery to find spiritual enlightenment. <laughs> but I'm sure it's a raccoon, and that's a nice oh little link God. to yeah, guidance. yeah. Wow, that's yeah. like that's like six degrees off. Yeah, Kevin Bacon. Bacon, who is also mentioned in Guardians of the Galaxy. This is just pure. pure this is just some it's just meant to be. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Yeah. Wow, it's all connecting the dots, as if it was meant to be. So yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy is is one of those things that that will keep on, hopefully, keep on getting better, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, he's uh, James Gunn's doing a sequel. He wasn't. He said he could not let go of Rocket and Groot. Yeah, which is good. All those characters, who, and I think he already had an idea for the second film as he was making the first one. That it's very rare that a, di- a di- director, when he leaves a project, does it actually get better. Mm. Oh, there is an exception, of course, Star Wars. Yeah, when Irving Kirshner and um, the other guy Mark Wand, mm. um, they did the uh, the other two Star Wars films, and they were just as good, you know. Yeah, if well, not better. M- I, Empire is better than Star Wars for me. I prefer yeah. it's a better film. Um, but I kind of get the feeling that James Gunn would not have gone through this movie without the support of everybody who was there to to kind of guide him along and to say yeah. we need a bit more of you in this. And I think the problem with the prequels is is, is people were trying to say to Lucas, we want a little bit less of you in this. Yeah. Um, we want to see the Star Wars of the world. We don't want it to be. I think that's the thing because I'd, I'd say Guardians is James Gunn's vision. What he had in his head, he has put on yeah. the screen, and it's fantastic. But it it's hasn't, funny. It's touching. He didn't go too far. But George Lucas got exactly on the, everything they had in his head on the screen. Yeah. But one's shit and one's brilliant. Yes. You know what I mean? It's as simple as that. Yeah, and it, and it and it it's just it's just an odd thing that two two different directors with two different budgets and and, and abilities and expectations. I th- I think maybe the expectation was also there with Star Wars that you know that he failed simply because he just couldn't hold the the big weight of of the first three films. Mm. James Gunn is going out on a limb here with a, his first outing with Guardians of the Galaxy, which not everybody knows about. Well, it, as a comic book, it was not... a big gamble when they first announced that they were doing it. Everyone thought it's just going to be Marvel's first flop. You know what I mean? Cause because they're picking a subject matter that nobody knows about. Yeah, really. no one's heard of Guardians of the Galaxy. I'd never heard of it. I'd never read a comic of Guardians of the Galaxy. You've got a a, a talking raccoon. A tree that primarily says three words. Well, it's not a tree; it's a plant. Yeah, I, I must admit, when going into this, when you said about the talking raccoon and a, and a tree, and I just kind of thought oh, it's it sounded so much. It, it does like <laughs> um, like fizzy wigging in Labyrinth and um, the trees in Lord of the Rings, and I kind of just thought, oh, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it off as much as possible, but then. But- it's again it's a testament to James Gunn to how much you care about a talking raccoon yeah I, I and yeah. the and like and by, by this like the characters he's the most tortured character I think the raccoon because he's literally been tortured ripped apart put back together and yeah, made into this yeah. little thing that there's not there's nothing else in the galaxy like Rocket yeah. you know what I mean he's the only one of him he's so unique, how yeah. alone that character must feel and it's, I think it's um, it's no mistake that the most tortured and damaged character is with the most innocent character, which is Groot. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's Groot is opposites. just pure innocence. Yeah. You know, they actually designed Groot's eyes to be like the eyes of a dog. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Because the dog is just loyal, and you know. Well, yeah, yeah. You look at that and you think, mm, well, mm. poor guy. Yeah, and um, that just the scene where um, Groot's created that big ball of, 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 yeah, of, 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 of plant life of, around yeah. them, you know, the cocoon just, of of 
Yeah. Yeah, and then Brock is like, what are you doing? You know, you're going to die. And then he says, you know, we are Groot. And I'm choked up. <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah. yeah, I was really choked up because I was invested yeah, in the characters. Exactly. You were there. You were there. You were there. That's, that's great. Yeah. That's great. In Phantom Menace, when, is it Qui Gon Jin? Is that his name? Liam? Gets, gets, when he gets killed, I was like, oh, fine. Fucking, I don't care. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you didn't do much while you were on the freaking screen anyway, so yeah, goodbye. Yeah, you talked too much. You talked about the Korean, you asshole. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that's a person. But I know, it's Liam, I know it's Liam Neeson, for I know. Sake. He cracked. But then yeah. a tree's about to die, and I was, I was welling up. I mean, brilliant. Okay, let's go through all the films where we've welled up over something that wasn't human. E.T.? But then there's the human. Well, there's a human connection, but yeah, connection, and there's yeah. also a plant involved, which, by the way, or, or tying this in, I, I actually had my world broken apart. We watched ET the other day, special edition. A lot yeah. of scenes I hadn't seen in there. A lot of new stuff, and then um, you know they're talking about the uh, the geranium plant yeah. that he brings to life, and and they, it you know Drew Barrymore in the, uh, the read along book she calls it a geranium. They call it geraniums in the film. Catherine sits there and she goes that's not a geranium that's a chrysanthemum oh, and I was like you're kidding me he said no that's a geranium it is a ge- that, it, look everybody said look look listen this is Drew Barrymore right now saying it's a geranium and it's like yeah yeah but it's, it's a chrysanthemum geranium is little lots of little plants lots of little tiny flowers bushed up together like that and a chrysanthemum is just one big one flower with a black middle on the middle and that's what you're looking at Stephen that is a chrysanthemum that's a huge mistake how did it how, how Steven Spielberg messed up unless they call those geraniums and there's kind of like but then plants are plants you know they stem from the Latin if they cannot get that right so all this time we've been thinking that they were geraniums but they're actually chrysanthemums that's a bit of a segue and it has yeah. nothing to do with going into that's the galaxy. That's a little bit of cool movie trivia, I guess, though. Yeah, because I, I looked around everywhere and nobody's talking about that, so I think we might have an exclusive there. Wow. And have you have you proven that it's definitely a when chrysanthemum? I, looked, I, looked I, I, I think it's pretty much, yeah, like for like. It's a chrysanthemum. I'm not saying that your darling wife would be wrong, I'm just saying have you seen Well, I, th- I said you're wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I dared, I dared, and then I said... I said, yeah, you're right, <laughs> which is usually the case, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Um, even if know, they're wrong, they even have to if be they're right. wrong. no, no, no. But th- th- this is dead on, and I kind of, I just had all of a sudden, I just saw all this time, you know, you see the plant in ET, you see geraniums, geraniums. Mm. So yeah, anyway, um, but yeah, the, the idea being is that we did, uh, we did have a connection. I, I, I think emotional when the plant came back to life yeah. in ET. So there is that connection there. Any other film where we are emotionally invested in a creature? Flight of the Navigator, was there anything there? It's a little tiny little creature in there. Yeah, but it's not really. Not really, not really. The and there's still a human connection. No, I mean, Because no the connection there is between a, ra- yeah, we're talking a raccoon and a tree. Right, okay. okay. Well, I, a plant, so no, well, I don't think so. I can't think of anything. No. What do you think of the dance off bit at the end? Dance off. That's okay. I loved it. I thought it was great because I wasn't expecting it. Again, it subverts your expectation. You know what I mean? I was so you didn't know what to expect. He's about to destroy the planet, and then he just starts dancing. I think it was a brilliant idea. That's the way it is. And he come up with the best put down I've ever heard of me in life. Turd, turd blossom. Turd blossom. <laughs> yeah, dance off, bitch. Come on, you. T- no, I was, uh, I'm trying to. Anyway, he calls him a turd blossom, and it's my favourite put down now. We had, a, and turd blossoms. we had a good uh, talking about um, talk downs. We had one in uh, college that we made up, and um, I'm going to mention him. Russell Cam, Russell Cam came up with this one. Right, you're such a log loser. Log loser. Yeah, it's <laughs> like you can't even keep your own shit. You know, you're a log loser. It was it was hilarious. Um, so that that's well, to me, it's hilarious. Yeah, that was funny. Log loser. But literally true because no one can keep hold of their own shit it's yeah. eventually going to come out and go forever yeah, yeah flush. Go, goes into the ocean which then <laughs> goes through a huge filter, filtration system which you eventually start to drink again shut up Morgan <laughs> Morgan Freeman's here in the room <laughs> in the room it's Morgan Freeman <laughs> uh, so yeah we, I think we've nailed every aspect that I wanted to talk about with Guardians of the Galaxy I'll be honest I could there's so much in the film that I could keep on talking about but I don't know people but 
it's it's refreshing it's yes. re- it's a space opera it's funny it's touching it's, it reminded me of watching Ray's Lost Ark for the very first time it gives you that kind of feeling of just going on an adventure and it's rewarding and you actually left the cinema feeling good that's a rare yeah. thing these days I mean uh, having gone to see Godzilla and Prometheus mm. and okay yeah visually enjoying the festivities of the visuals but just being let down by the dialogue and the characters and the whole situation yeah. that's there you come out of this feeling very very it's like a good meal that you've just digested yeah. and again when we've talked previously about how um, a film can make you invest in the director I've gone back and I've watched all James, James Gunn stuff, yeah. stuff yeah or this PG Palm thing he did on YouTube, which is which is really funny, I've read his book, which is very funny. If any of that's true, I feel sorry for the poor guy. He went through some shit, <laughs> and um, yeah, just a brilliant guy, brilliant writer, brilliant director. Can't wait to see Guardians too. Yeah, and I think I think that that's good to have an investment in in, I mean, in directors these days. I mean, it's it's hard to kind of there's so many out there and uh, mm. yeah, but it sounds like he's kind of got his finger in a few pies as well it doesn't just direct he does other things oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. does he act as well it, it, is there a cameo James Gunn cameo or um, I, you know uh, when he first gets the orb mm-hmm. um, and he has the two guys behind it and, you know yes yes well I think he's one of them I think he's the one who come, calls a ninja turtle Oh, yeah, I think he's funny. one of them. But he he has acted in the past. He's in a film that he wrote but didn't direct. I forget what it's called now, but it's it. It's about like um, I think it's the six or seventh best superheroes in in that in that sort of made up world, and they're a bit useless, I think. And it's about it's about them. I forget oh, what it's called. Did, that Rob Lowe's in it. Oh, hang on. Is it is it a, a fairly recent one? Two. I could I could see an orange man in a suit. Oh, shall I open the vacuum cleaner? Yeah, go on, open the vacuum cleaner. So, oh, oh my god! Uh, oh my god, it's Andy, Andy, Andy! Oh, hang on, it, it's it's really the fan is blowing really hard. Just hold on, hold on to it. No, no, uh, I'm gonna have to close it. I'm gonna have to close it. That's oh, okay. That's okay. It's okay. The fans calm down. It's calm down. Oh, my god! Wow! I thought I lost you then. You literally were gonna. Oh, be my hair's so- blown off. Andy, you don't have any hair. Oh right. That's okay. Um, so like, what we're, what we're, doing, we're gonna look something up. We're gonna look something up right now. Internet Movie Database. What were we looking for? Um, just put James Gunn. There we go. James. Oh yeah, that superhero. Oh look, James Gunn. He, he's, he's smiling face. Okay, when you write in James, you've got James Spader, my favorite actor. James Franco. Yeah. James McAvery. McAvoy. Mm. Ma- <laughs> McAvoy. <laughs> McAvery. Hey, look at this. They're, they're, they're kind of all, you know, we've got X Men, X Men. Oh, I love that James Gunn is before James Cameron. I love that. Yeah, Fuck James you, Cameron. James Cameron. Okay, so you're looking at, is it that one, movie 43? No, it's definitely not that. God, that's off. <laughs> Keep going down. Uh... Directing? Oh, no, he didn't direct it, but he wrote it. Ooh. The specials, that's it. The specials. The specials. And uh, just before Scooby Doo. Okay. Yeah, just before a Scooby Doo. Yeah. But in fact, that's the only one I've not seen, but I do have now, so I'm going to watch that. But if you actually look at his. Uh, I mean, I'm just, just having a look there. The stuff that he's done Dawn of the Dead screenplay. Yeah. 2004. I love that movie. Yeah, that's James great. James Gunn did that. Yeah. I am impressed, Mr. Gunn. Slither. Tro- have you ever seen Slither? That's great. Now film. we we said that before that I thought it was the Sharon Stone film. Yeah, no, not that one. But it's not. It's got leather uh, with a T. Because funny, because Michael Rooker is in every film that James Gunn's directed. Really? Yeah, and he's in that. He's in Super, and obviously he's in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes. So is Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion's in all three. You uh-huh. know um, when they're in the the kill in the prison. And, gotcha. that, and that big blue thing is like going to Peter Quill like oh look at you pretty thing and then Groot sticks his fingers up his nose and lifts him up that's voiced by Nathan Fillion oh there you go you know what I mean I love that but I like a director Gail Del Toro is very similar where he he finds actors that he likes and gets along with and, and loves and always uses them because I think that's important to a film 
that the director gets along with the actors and actually likes them as people. Well, there's, a, you, there's a trust, there's a bond. Well, can you imagine? Because yeah. probably from start to finish, you're talking between a year and a half to two years to get a film writ, wrote, a lot of time. You know, written, produced, direct, you know, made, directed, post-production, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Imagine doing that with people you don't like. That must be awful, because it must be a quite solitary thing to be a director of a film. Yeah. And to be yeah. on set with people you can't get along with who are not very nice. That must be difficult. So. It, uh, I think they probably that's why they weed them out as early as possible. If they're going to be a trouble, then uh, they they know it's going to af- if it's going to affect, then they usually get fired. Mm. They usually get going, or or they just deal with it because they're told to deal with it by the studios because well, they yeah, need exactly. uh, as a ca- th- this person as a cash in. So to surround yourselves with people who have got the chops, but also you are your friends that you can trust, and you get along with them. I think you know you can you can work with mm, them. Yeah. I think that's how he's he's made this film so great. But know? I think most of the best films are like that. The best, I mean, if you think about the, your top five films, are the directors usually quite synonymous with the actors? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, because I'd say so. I mean, yeah. I'm looking. I'm thinking Taxi Driver, Godfather, Deer Hunter. Well, I say Michael Cimino. He's not really, but the the the, the ensemble of the mm. cast are often quite. Actors tend to tend to also like working with each other again. If they've had a really good experience, yeah, but to do something different, yeah, and it's good. Like if you've got like with De Niro and Scorsese, where De Niro can say, "I really want to make this film about Jake Lamotta," you know what yeah. I mean? And okay, then, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna help you do that. I'm gonna really do it. Okay, is yeah, that okay? That's great. Right. Okay, but Woody Allen didn't direct. No, I was I was doing Scorsese. I was doing Scorsese. <laughs> I was doing Scorsese. <clears throat> Because he talks really fast and he likes to get things out really quick, quick, really quick, 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 quick. Okay. Um. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with Guardians of the Galaxy. It's out on Blu-ray now. Yes. Buy it. Buy it, and. Uh, Not in 4K Blu-ray though. I found so. Come on, James, get it out in 4K Blu-ray. Please. 4K Blu-ray. I have no idea. Do you know what? I'm still, on, I'm still just on the DVD um, phenomenon I'm, I'm just discovering DVDs well um, most, of the, most of the HD TVs are like 1080 and uh, the Blu-ray's 1080p yeah. but now like myself has now got a 4K TV so instead of being 1080 it's 4000 resolution I mean okay. cinema is dead no it's not it's Guardians of the Galaxy has come out yeah, 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 it's pretty, no, no 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 but the, the buildings I mean you can watch it at home it's going to be amazing yeah, that, that's true. That's true. One, one thing that I do want to touch upon that's quite interesting that I, I like the time that it takes for a film to from being in the cinema to actually being available for home release, the time that it takes it's now about three months. Yeah, latency period between cinema. I mean, that used to be ten months. Mm. It used to be uh, ten months before you could even rent, and the system used to be in place where you would see it in the cinema, and only until the end of the run does it actually count ten months before yeah, you can actually I, rent. Yeah, I think there's there's many reasons for that. I think one of them is piracy. Yes. So, did it? If we can get it out on Blu-ray very quickly, they're not going to want to watch this cam version of the film. They're going to want to buy it on Blu-ray and watch it. They're going to be patient, and so a lot of it they're investing in the technology yeah. now as much as possible. But yeah, you know, I think the society now, everything's on demand, and yeah. people want things now. Yeah, they don't want to wait for things, you know. And I think I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, and and that's why slow films are you know any film that takes its time is called a slow film. Yeah. Oh, is that what's that noise? That is actually not a sound effect that I have inserted. Is that in in with the drill again? There's a guy with a drill. He's putting up security lights at Tosser. Damn it! Who does he think he is? Yeah. Do you know? What? I'm just going to go around his house at night and steal his DVD. No, uh, no, Bluetooth player. Bluetooth player. Yeah. Blu-ray mate. Bluetooth player. <laughs> <laughs> you get his Bluetooth player, come back and go, oh, I've got all these Blu-rays, can't do anything with it. <laughs> so how does this Bluetooth player work? <laughs> Where do I put the disc in? It's shocking. <laughs> it's just bad. Actually, to be honest, I have to admit, um, I, my, no, I, actually, no, it wasn't me, it was my brother. My brother actually put toast in a VHS recorder. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. Did it cook it? <laughs> no, he, had to, he actually thought he could play it. He put toast. He put his toast in the VCR. Really? Yeah. It wasn't me. I thought it was me, actually. But then I realised, I don't know, it was my brother. Did he watch porn films and think he could stick his penis in a VHS player and have sex with it? 
the end. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's the line. So I don't know how to end this because we, you know, um, with, with the David Lynch thing, we had something to end with, but... Goodbye, everybody. Oh, goodbye. We're out of here. Look, I'm in my rocket ship. Are you ready? Yeah. Ready? You got your, you got your throttle? throttle? Okay. All right, I'll go there. Go, go. Okay, just, just push it forward a little bit there. Okay. We're going to fly this ship out of here. You ready? Okay. Okay. Bye. You're so shit. <laughs> Liquid storage bags. You will never get caught short again thanks to Liquid Storage Bags. Here you get eight, that's right, eight bags in which you can store your very own liquid items. Bags are sold separately, liquid not included. The attractive cardboard box is easy to open. With each wonderfully transparent, durable and easily accessible. Ready, ready to, to go. go! That's right, when you've got to go, liquid storage bags are there for you. Liquid storage bags? That's right! Liquid, Liquid storage, storage bags. bags! They're sleek, sturdy, and stylish. And what's more, you can write all the information you need right there on the bag. Where the space is provided. Warning, do not write on liquid storage bags. Liquid storage bags cannot be found in any store, by phone, or online. So you know that liquid storage bags are the product for you. And only you! What's it called? Liquid storage bags! Ah, uh, yeah. yeah! Liquid storage bags!